Hey guys, welcome to another episode. Hello, hello, hello. I hope everyone's doing well. Yes, yes. All our prayers out to you and your loved ones. So we just um, get through 2021. It just got here. It feels like it's been here for a while. <laughs> it's like, oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> Still a lot happening. A lot. So tonight, um, our guest is Dr. Becky Lynn. Um, she's the founder of and CEO of the Evora Women's Health, as well as an adjunct associate professor of OBGYN at St. Louis University. Dr. Lynn's research focuses on the effects of cannabis on sexual function in women. I'm going to be really listening into this. Uh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> she has published papers in the scientific literature and has presented her research both nationally and internationally, both at the ISSWSH conference in Atlanta and in the International Society for the S- uh, Study of Sexual Medicine conference in Beijing, China. Dr. Lynn has been featured in numerous podcasts and several articles in the cannabis space. Welcome, Dr. Lynn. Thank you for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Uh, we are so excited. I, I mean, I am really excited because yeah. <laughs> I want to learn so much. So, yeah, we are starting off our fe- month of February. We- we're focusing on the love in the love in Canada. So we're going to have um, featured guests like Dr. Lynn to talk about uh, sex health, relationships, marriage. So it's going to be a good month of February. So yes. stay tuned for that. Yes, all about the love. So welcome, Dr. Lynn. So uh, thanks. what got you into this uh, to study this field in particular? Because this is really interesting. OBGYN, yes, but then the sexual function and things of that nature, how right. did that all come about? So, you know, it just fell into my lap. Um, you know, I never set out to be the sex doctor or the cannabis doctor, um, but it just happened. I think because I feel comfortable talking about sex with women, and I think it's you know, sexual health is really, really important. And it's something that gets shoved under the rug and not talked about. And I, Mm -hmm. I was seeing those problems in my gynecology practice. And when I came out of residency, I didn't really have much training in sexual health. So I sought out that training on my own and I learned so much and really realized how much I could help women, um, you know, not just with their, their sexual function, but their relationships, which, you know, spills over into the family and their overall well-being and, and happiness. So um, I, I just kind of fell into my lap. And I think once my patients realized and my, my partners realized that that that's what I was doing, they said, oh, go see Dr. Lynn. You got to go see Dr. Lynn. And even my partners, I had partners who really didn't want to talk about sex or didn't feel comfortable talking about sex, um, my work partners. And so they would refer their patients to me. And I've just been doing it since then. Wow. So how, I see you have an article and relates to um, cannabis use. How did you get, now how did that start? Yeah, so that started um, probably about 2015. Mm -hmm. Um, I was hearing from many women that they would come to see me for, oh, you know, orgasm problems or low libido or sexual pain. And they would say to me, well, but you know, if I use marijuana, it's all better. Hmm. And so I, you know, I, I thought to myself, well, I wonder what do we know about that and how much truth is there in that? So I went to the medical literature, published studies and journals, and there really is, as you can imagine, not a lot of information about cannabis and sexual function. Um, but if you go to the internet, there's tons of information about how great it is, but you know, you never know what's a reliable source on the internet or what you can believe. So, um, a couple of us at St. Louis University set out to do a questionnaire because in Missouri, recreational marijuana is illegal. And at the time, medical marijuana was illegal also. So it's not like we could give people marijuana and measure their sexual function or see what happened. Um, so the, the best that we could do was um, to evaluate women's perceptions, what they thought about the sexual experience when they use marijuana. And so I was um, part of a big department. There were, you know, many, many patients that came through our offices and everybody who came into our office got a questionnaire and we asked women, not everybody answered it, but we, I can't remember now the exact number, but close to 400 women, 300 and something women answered the questionnaire 
And we asked them, you know, do you think it improved? Did, uh, well, first of all, you know, did do you use marijuana? Then do you use marijuana before sex? And then if you answered yes to that, how did it affect your sexual experience? Was it better? Was it worse? How did it affect your desire? Better, worse? And then we asked by how much? How did it affect your orgasm? How did it affect lubrication? How did it affect pain? And what we found was that the majority of women said that the overall sexual experience was improved, their desire was improved, orgasm improved, was, and, and their pain was lessened. Not a big difference. It was about half and half for lubrication. Um, and then we also found that women who used marijuana frequently compared to infrequently were more likely to report better orgasms just in their general health unrelated to marijuana. Um, and that women who used marijuana versus women who didn't were also more likely, it was twice as likely to report good orgasms, better orgasms just in general. So, um, so we, we found some interesting things. It was pretty fascinating and, um, we published it. And so that's, yeah, that's how I got here. Wow. It's an interesting journey. (laughs) So let me ask you this. When you started the courses themselves and you're studying all this about sexual function, Mm -hmm. how much were you surprised you did know versus you didn't know and the same thing, the same question being applied to cannabis and then putting them together. Yes, that is an excellent question because I didn't know how much I didn't know until I started to take courses on sexual health. I can remember the first course that I went to. I came home and I was just like, oh, my gosh, Like there was so much that I realized that I didn't know about women's sexual health and I was so grateful that I could bring home all this new knowledge that I could use to help people. And since then, I've been very involved with um, ISWISH, which is the International Society for the Study of Women's Sexual Health. They have courses. Um, I go to the conference every year. You know, I keep up to date on, you know, the the newest research and and newest recommendations regarding women's sexual health. And, you know, it's just fascinating. And we're learning new things every day because if you compare it to men's sexual health, there's always so much more research and focus on men's sexual health. But I think even in the last, you know, five, seven years, I've seen the, the area, the concentration of women's sexual health just grow tremendously. When it comes to cannabis, oh my gosh, there is so much I didn't know. (laughs) And one thing that I've been doing since I published that paper, we published that one, then we wrote a review on cannabinoids and um, sexual function in women. And all of this is just available on the internet. You don't have to have a subscription. It's their open access journals. Um, So but since then, I um, I was asked to create a course on cannabis and women's sexual health, which are not sorry, not women's sexual health, but women's health in general, um, which I did. And I, I have that I have one course designed for um, people who are not in the medical profession. And then um, I have another one that's designed for physicians and other practitioners. And in doing so, in doing those, I looked at um, the the effects of cannabis and CBD and other cannabinoids on um, menstrual cycle, Ooh. fertility, pregnancy, lactation, pelvic pain, and sexual function, um, but also the role of the endocannabinoid system. And the endocannabinoid system is it's what the what cannabis. So that we have a natural, you may know, you guys probably are fully aware of the endocannabinoid system with <laughs> your child. Yes. But um, it is, it is the, it's sort of like the natural system that we have receptors in our bodies that cannabis binds to. But why do we have those receptors? They're part of something called the endocannabinoid system, whose um, role is to maintain homeostasis and stability and balance in your body. And that's why, you know, some of the cannabinoids work great for seizures because, you know, seizures are this common constant firing of neurons and it calms, calms those nerves down. So I was a hundred percent unaware of the endocannabinoid system, even when I, when I started studying sexual function in marijuana and I, it's like this whole new world. And I also think I'm excited for the future and research because as marijuana becomes more, has becomes legal in more States, you know, it's completely legal medicinal and recreational in Canada. We'll have We'll have the ability to do 
higher quality studies to, to learn so much more. And because the endocannabinoid system is found throughout your entire body, there's, there's so much potential there for using cannabinoids as medicine in the future. Got it. Yeah, we, yeah, definitely. We're, so, we're really excited about that too, really. Huh? So in terms of like for the listeners, when you say uh, sex health, sexual health, what does that entail? Mm-hmm. Yeah. So it it can be kind of confusing because I think when people say sexual health, they think STD screening, condoms, contraception. (laughs) And so, yeah, that's what comes to mind first. And and I guess I should, maybe I shouldn't use that term, but um, what I really focus on my practice is more like sexual dysfunction. Um, But I never want to tell a woman, well, you have sexual dysfunction, right? (laughs) It just sounds bad. It's almost like you never want to tell a man he's impotent. You might want to say, well, you have ED. It just sounds better. (laughs) I don't know if it does <laughs> as a guy. So, if, you know, I, if I say I run a sexual dysfunction clinic. Who wants to go to that? No one. So, no one, yeah. yeah, nobody wants to, to own up to that. So, um, but really, when I say I focus on sexual health, it's really helping women with sexual problems or sexual issues, which are super common and very normal. Um, and I think that a lot of women are embarrassed or they think they're the only ones mm-hmm. because everyone around them is talking about how great their sex life is. But the ones whose sex life isn't so great, they're not talking about it. So we sort of think, oh, everybody else is normal and I'm abnormal. But but there are a lot of sexual issues that arise that are very common in, in women. Talking about that, I, I want to uh, ask you a question about libido, particularly mm-hmm. um, mothers after having a baby yep. it's like a big it's a, it's a big yes. issue and it's it's it, it causes problems in relationships so what are you seeing with that and how anything have you done for young for mothers um, at, um with their sexual health after yes so that is a definitely a big deal i mean if you think about you know, who you are as a partner, as a woman before having children, you focus on your spouse or your partner, you have children, and now you're somebody's mother. And that is, as it should be, your number one priority. And many women also, not only are they raising children, but they're working full time. And so sex and relationships and, you know, your partner go to the very bottom of the list. You're exhausted when you get in bed at night. And, you know, a lot of women feel like I can't give one more ounce of myself, (laughs) you know, because you're 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 doing so much and that can definitely cause problems in a relationship. And, um, I, and what I, what I recommend to women is, you know, don't, you have to nurture your relationship. Don't forget about your partner and you're not a bad mother. If you get a babysitter, so you and your partner can go have a date night or do something together because it's so easy. You know, your partner's going to be there at the end of the day. So you don't, have to, you you don't have to worry about that. But then, you know, I I believe that couples who don't have sex grow apart. And Mm. so it becomes, what becomes a little problem becomes a big problem. And I've definitely seen couples who haven't had sex in 10 years and it's a problem. Uh, Yeah. Yeah. A big problem. (laughs) And then it comes to a head and it's, you know, it's a, it's a huge problem. Um, so, um, so that's one thing, make your, make your partner priority. It doesn't make you a bad mother. If you, you know, leave child grandmother while you have a date night. And then I also see a lot of, um, women who maybe they were working women, you know, motivated, a great career, have a child, decide to stay home. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, but then maybe they, you know, maybe gain some weight. They don't feel so good about themselves. They don't, They don't want to go to the gym because they feel bad about leaving the child. And it's just, it's sort of this, you know, it's sort of like a, A it's like a vicious cycle and they're not feeling sexy. So they don't want to have sex with their partner and it becomes a problem. So I see that too. I call that the mommy syndrome. Definitely. Yeah. I've been there. Mm -hmm. Well, how much is it of psychological versus physical? So is it psychologically they first start to self-analyze women? I mean, start to look at themselves after having I mean, like, oh my god, I got this, oh, I got mm. a stretch mark, I got an extra pound, I don't mm. feel sexy anymore. And uh-huh. then is it, oh my god, I'm exhausted. I just finished breastfeeding. I just finished mm. cleaning the dishes. I'm putting yep. him to him. Or, I'm putting the baby to bed. I'm, you know, it's like all these things. So, like, which comes first? 
or is it the um, same? Well, I think so. So with libido, I mean, I, I think it's a combination mm. um, of like physiologic mm. and um, psychologic. And I think each woman, each woman is different in, you know, is it mostly physiologic? Is it mostly psychologic? And some women aren't bothered by a couple pounds. Other women are horrified by a couple pounds. Um, and some women have more self-confidence than other women. And some women are more motivated to get dressed during the day, you know, which, which helps build self-confidence. Sometimes if you stay home and you wear sweatpants and you never, you know, put yourself together, it's just, you're not feeling very sexy at the end of the day. So I think it's different for every woman. Is that, does that answer the question or maybe I didn't quite understand no, the question no. right? No, 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 you answered it. Uh, you answered it. Thank you very much. Okay. Cause that, that always mm -hmm. was on the back of my mind. Like, is it the psychological or is it the physical? Like which one's coming first? Like which one cuts the other first off in a sense? Mm -hmm. And it's like mm -hmm. this disconnect, but it could be either or depending on the person. Yes. Also, do you think the hormones after uh, pregnancy has anything to do with it? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, so it depends on the time frame. Also, like when you say after pregnancy, so in that, especially in that immediate postpartum period, your hormones are you know all over the place. You're sleep deprived. Um, if you're breastfeeding, uh, you might have vaginal dryness, which causes pain. Um, your nipples might be sore if you're breastfeeding. Mm. So that immediate postpartum period is, is really tough. Um, as you get further out, it's less reliant, you know, on what your hormonal status is. Um, until you get sort of to your forties where your testosterone levels go down, your estrogen levels are going down and, and sometimes just being haywire and, um, and then hormones play a bigger role. So it's more like hormones have a big role in that immediate postpartum period. And then when, once you get into your forties and, and then fifties, sixties and so on, because, you know, when you look at testosterone, which is one of the hormones that affects desire, but not the only hormone that affects desire. You know, for women, their testosterone starts going down in their early 30s. And so that sometimes oh. corresponds to when they're having kids, like that's in their, oh. their reproductive years. Um, but women's testosterone definitely starts to, to go down on the earlier side, especially compared to men. That make, that it make, it makes a lot of sense what you're saying it makes mm -hmm. a lot of sense yeah because we were experiencing it for some time so yeah, yeah. It, it puts it's putting some pieces together a lot of pieces mm -hmm. together so in terms of so we have um, a CBD lube what are your mm -hmm. thoughts on that um, have yep. you seen it work? So tell us yes. uh, what, what, what your thoughts about a CBD as a, a lubrication. Yeah. So I believe in CBD as a lube and here's why. So there's really no scientific evidence studies, or at least I have not seen any in the medical literature where somebody took a CBD lube and then somebody took a placebo lube and tested, you know, did it, did it help with pain, which is where I use it in my practice. Um, and so what, what I found, I treat a lot of women with pelvic pain, some with chronic pelvic pain, so really bad, serious pelvic pain where they have a lot of contributing factors. They might have endometriosis, um, which is where you get uterine tissue that implants outside of the uterus. They might have interstitial cystitis, which is bladder pain syndrome, or vaginismus, where they have pelvic floor muscle spasm. I see many women with chronic, chronic pain. And, you know, in, in everything that I've learned about marijuana and CBD is that they have an analgesic effect. They help with pain. And that's pretty clear in the medical literature. Um, the, the analgesic effect of CBD, what I've seen most studied is, you know, oral CBD. So it's not a CBD loop. But knowing what I know about cannabinoids and their ability to lessen pain, um, we... Uh, have recommended a CBD lube to several of our patients. And I, and it, this is not a scientific study, but I have really seen really good results with CBD lube. I can think of specifically two patients who had chronic pelvic pain, terrible sexual pain. You know, they were seen by me in St. Louis and then they, you know, were at Mayo and Northwestern and, and big name hospitals with pelvic pain experts. And both were at their wits end. They're like, I'll try anything. And I think it came up because 
you know, we were talking now medical marijuana is legal in Missouri and you can use it for chronic pain. And so I think we discussed that and then somehow we ended up on CBD, which, you know, you can just get easily. And so my two patients tried that It really helped with their painful sex. And so then the question is, is it the CBD that's that's decreasing their pain or is it the other stuff that's in the loop? Yeah, we don't know. But for me, as a physician, I was just so happy it helped them, you know. So so we carry, um, and I do not work for this company, but we carry Quim CBD Lube in our office, oh, yeah, and we've had that. good results. Can you spell that? Q U I M M. Q U I M M. Quim. Yeah. Oh, okay. They have um, they have a one called Happy Clam and one called Smooth Operator, and the Smooth Operator has a little more CBD in it, and so that's the one that seems to work best with my patients. Mm, so anecdotally, it could be the CBD. So it could be, yeah, but we don't know because yeah. it's, it's anecdotal evidence. It's exactly. like okay, based on two people, is that really real? Who knows? And maybe it's placebo effect. But if it is, I'm still happy because they're happy. Exactly. They feel better. Exactly. Well, in reference to that, uh, I mean, with CBD, we, it's known that it uh, helps with inflammation. So mm-hmm. it's, a yep. lot of times, I mean, the dryness and the pain could be from what, the ir- irritation? Absolutely. Wow. Yep. Interesting. Yeah, inflammation too, definitely. Yep. Now, what kind of ingredients would be appropriate? I mean, because uh, I understand it's very sensitive there and it's mm-hmm. like very raw. So anything can go wrong just with a scratch. So mm-hmm. basically with the ingredients. So. Oh, yeah, so it depends on if you're premenopausal or postmenopausal. Um, the premenopausal vagina is like thicker, moister. It doesn't um, doesn't tear as easily, doesn't scratch as easily, stretches. You know, so you can have a baby. Um, <laughs> For a second, I didn't know what you were um, talking about. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, the postmenopausal vagina is the tissue gets very thin and dry, and it gets irritated very easily. So. You do have to be careful what you use if you have a postmenopausal vagina because, you know, there's a lot of lubes out there. There's lubes that are tingly and lubes that are this and that, and, and the tissue can be irritated. But I will definitely say that in my postmenopausal women with chronic sexual pain like that or vulvar pain during sex, I'll, I'll u- almost always recommend low-dose vaginal hormones because the low-dose vaginal hormones like estrogen um, restore the elasticity, restore the thickness and the lubrication um, to the vagina and make it much less likely to get irritated from anything at all. That's interesting. Yeah. I'm learning so much right now. <laughs> now, uh, have you come across uh, a client, it just seems like, anything you tried until cannabis um, where they was like nothing else that within your, uh, you know, your means that you were able to support them, but with the introduction of cannabis and anything else, like I was just thinking about maybe a yoga class for flexibility or some type of, uh, you know, some type of, uh, I guess, body movement uh, exercise Um, like Pilates. So it depends. Yeah. It depends on, on what they have. And I do recommend yoga for my, um, for all of my patients actually. Um, but especially for chronic pelvic pain and anybody who has a component of pelvic floor muscle spasm, because yoga can really relax the pelvis, improve flexibility. And many women with chronic pelvic pain also have anxiety and yoga is the greatest thing since sliced bread for anxiety, because it teaches you to take these big, deep breaths that help calm everything down. Um, so I think yoga is great for everybody, especially women with chronic pelvic pain. And actually, we do now, I just have to say this one little plug, um, <laughs> we offer through Evora um, virtual yoga. Ooh. And it's open to anyone. So not just my patients, but anybody can sign up through our website. And it's the um, fourth Monday of every month. And we have a fantastic instructor. And it's, I'm just really excited about it. Congrats. Yeah, definitely signing up. <laughs> yeah, <that's laughs> EvoraWomen.com. <laughs> <laughs> now, with the women, do you um, do you see them taking tinctures, you know, CBD tinctures, um, and then engage in sex, to, uh, and then come back and tell you, you know, I was more relaxed, I didn't feel so stressed, I was laid back, I was in the moment? 
Some, yes. So we do um, have a couple of people. And you have to remember that the people that I'm recommending this to are paying patients. Mm. So it's a different population than, hey, let's just want, let's just relax a little and try some CBD. It's a different population. Um, but, um, so, so yeah, some of our pain patients, um, have tried like a tincture and it helps them relax. Got it. Got it. Mm-hmm. So just yeah. to talk about, um, your work as a, um, sex therapy, um, um mm-hmm. postgraduate training institute. So tell us about your, um, your marriage, um, um, your sexual counseling for, for couples. Yeah. Oh, that's funny. I thought you were going to ask me about my own marriage. Yeah, I was, I was like, oh, Sorry. wow, we're getting personal. Oh. Okay. Well, his name's Patrick. Yeah. He's really cool. And no, I'm just kidding. Um, no, so I, um, the, the, the reason that I did this was because once you start treating women for sexual problems, you realize that the relationship is a huge part of that. And I really had no training in how to discuss relationships or communication. Um, And so that's what prompted me to um, go and get my training in sexual counseling. And I, I, I really use those skills in my everyday practice. So I don't, I do separate it out and I do have couples where I just do sexual counseling and it's, you know, basic counseling. We walk through their issues and come up with plans on how to, you know, fix the issues that they're having, um, And so, so I definitely use those skills, but I also use them in my medical practice because it's very hard to separate those two out. So are how, how open are patients when it comes to, Mm -hmm. you know, when they come in for a a visit, how open are patients to talk to you about their um, sexual health, sexual dysfunction? Yep. So it is so variable. Some women come in and just say it all, not embarrassed, (laughs) not one bit. And then other people can't say the word vagina and they can't, they, you know, they're very nervous and they, it's so hard for them to say it. And so there's just a spectrum. So definitely everybody's different with their comfort level of, you know, talking about sex. Got it. Got it. Got it. Got it. Now, with the women that do come to your practice, um, I, I'm assuming they have to be women from an everyday walk of life. You know, your corporate, your house mom, mm-hmm. your like your grad students, or things like that. And how much stress plays on it too, as well? If you know they're in these areas, how much stress plays into sexual dysfunction? Yes. Yeah, Um, it definitely can play into sexual dysfunction. So for women, you know, I always say it doesn't take that much stress to take away a woman's sex drive. Um, Whereas, and these are broad generalizations, so I hope I'm not going to offend you. But like for men, you need, you know, famine or war or something before their sex drive really changes. (laughs) But for women, it just takes a little bit to put sex as the very last priority. So stress definitely plays a role, definitely plays a role. And there's another reason to do yoga, to lower your stress levels. Oh, yeah. interesting. Now, you recommend uh, yoga before sex, after sex, during sex? Oh, that's sex? funny because I don't really recommend it before or after, but just in <laughs> general. <laughs> I mean, you could, maybe you could just make it part of your sex play. That's I, 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 that was my next part. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you could do it that way. Make it interesting. Um, but I just recommend it in general on a regular basis because of all of its benefits. <laughs> Makes a lot of sense. Thank now, so. with the dis- uh, sexual uh, health of some women... How much does it affect, like, the overall health of the body? Does it trigger certain ailments that wouldn't be there? Trying to think. I don't I don't think there's any thing that it would trigger unrelated to the actual sexual problem that they're having. Mm-hmm. Um, sometimes sexual dysfunction, this is kind of a, on a side note, but sometimes sexual dysfunction can be a sign of an underlying medical disease, especially in men. So erectile dysfunction can show up as a it's sort of a red flag for, for cardiovascular disease. Oh. So, um, so those two are related, but specifically for women, I, I don't think I can say, I don't, I don't think so. Okay. Now with your practice, uh, it's been open for how long so far and how many women have you been seeing coming since you opened? Yes. 
So actually, today is my practice's birthday. Yay. We've been open Happy for birthday. one year. Congrats. Day. Congrats. So, um, yeah. So I um, I opened it last year, February 3rd, 2020. Oh, so as wow. you can imagine, right before COVID. it's been a roller coaster yeah. ride because of the pandemic. Um, but before that, I mean, I've been in practice for 20 years. So, um, but in my current practice, Evora, we've just been open for one year. That's it. Wow. And the number of women that have come through the door? Oh, sorry. Yeah, like probably about 250 or so. Wow, that's a lot for, in, yeah. in the midst of a pandemic. Yeah, that's amazing. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Congratulations. It was Congratulations. You <laughs> yeah. So you, you have seen a lot of women during this time, especially during COVID and lockdown, that they yeah. was, I mean, we the are numbers doing, have grown. So it's much better now than it was. You mm-hmm. know, when we... We got started in February and then March, April, May. I mean, it was it was actually a really interesting time for me as just because I really wasn't working much. And if you think about the life of a physician, you know, medical school is totally busy, crazy. Residency is really busy, crazy. You know, then I spent 20 years full practice and overnight call. I don't do obstetrics anymore, but I did for 20 years and my life has always been crazy busy. And then I opened a practice and then a pandemic hit and all of a sudden I was at home, yeah, you know, lot. day in, day out. That's a big and change. It was so weird, but, and I did virtual visits, but for the, for several months it was, it was pretty slow going, but I think, I think we're doing okay now. Oh, congrats again. Congrats. Now, yeah. if, now if, uh, people wanted uh, the women uh, listeners that we have, if they wanted to reach out to you, how would they contact you? Mm-hmm. So um, you can always go to my website, which is Evora. So it's E V as in Victor, O R A women.com. Um, there's a, a way that says contact us and it'll send me an email. So if you need to reach out to me that way, you can reach me via email. You can sign up for a newsletter. Um, I'm also on Facebook and Instagram. Evora Women's Health has a page, but also Becky K. Lynn MD um, has a Facebook page and Instagram. So, and I LinkedIn. So I, I feel like I'm pretty reachable. People can find me. Okay, awesome. And I want to thank you so much for advocating and taking and doing the research. Yes, thank you. You're welcome. And being a I've enjoyed it. Physician who's, who's advocating out there for uh, medical cannabis use. We really appreciate yeah. it because it's just about getting the word out. Yeah. Yes, yes. And educating because, I mean, I, I've learned a lot. And it kind of also helped me look at the big picture because there was so much going on, especially in our personal life. So yes. I understand now. Because it was hard. Yeah. It was hard. A lot of times I'm like, it's in her head, but I'm like, but I'm not in there. So I have no idea what's going on. Right, right. Oh, well, thank you again. Well, I'm glad it's worked for you. That's amazing, an amazing story. We appreciate it. Thank you again, Dr. Lynn. Now, if we want to have you back on, I mean, or will you be available for us? Yes. Awesome. I like talking. <laughs> good, good. Oh, well, uh, are, you be, are you going to be doing any webinars? Are you going to be doing any... Uh, events that people could tune in? Yeah, so I am actually doing, so I, I have set up to do um, a webinar, but it's, it's, it's the lectures that I was talking about that's really for um, medical practitioners. Mm. Um, I don't have anything scheduled yet for people who aren't in the medical profession, but I'm sure I will be doing that. So if you follow me on Facebook and Instagram, I always post when I'm doing lectures, webinars, anything like that. Yes. Awesome. Thank you again Mm -hmm. for joining us. We really appreciate it. Sure. All right. Thank you. Good night. 